Welcome back. In this video, we are continuing with chapter three in CORE's uh, The Economy and Principles of Macroeconomics. And we are going to build our multiplier model uh, looking at aggregate demand. And so uh, let's hop right in. And aggregate demand, we mean, is the, the total amount that people want to buy in the economy. Now, we're going to make some simplifying assumptions here. Uh, and we're going to assume that we don't have any government and we don't have any foreign trade. Um, so this is just a simplifying assumption. We can add those things back in and we will do that at the end. Um, but this just makes it a little bit easier to understand what's going on in our multiplier model. Um, so in that case, we are going to assume that our aggregate demand is just equal to consumer spending, C, and investment spending, I. Um, and remember, so this is the reason they sort of break out our inventory investment uh, so that, you know, sometimes output is not completely equal to aggregate demand and that will go into inventory investment. So either we produce more than we buy and inventory investment increases or we buy more than we produce and inventory investment decreases. All right, so how are we going to graph this? So all of our models in this uh book are mostly in graphs with a little bit of math. Well, so on the horizontal axis, we're going to put output, uh, which we can, you know, whenever we say output or GDP um, or Y, that's all the same thing. So that is on our horizontal axis. And on our vertical axis, we're going to have first just consumer spending. We will add in investment spending in a little bit. And so then the question is, all right, well, how does consumer spending relate to output. Well, we know that output and income are the same. And so a reasonable assumption is that there's some amount of spending that you have to do regardless of your income, or at least regardless of the, the country's income. We'll call that autonomous consumption and we'll label it C0. And then for every extra dollar of income you get, you spend more. And so that means that our consumption function, our C, is equal to C0, that's our autonomous consumption, plus some uh, marginal propensity to consume, and we'll talk about that in just a second, times income, total income, or GDP, or Y. And so our C1 here is going to be really important. We call it our marginal propensity to consume. What does that mean? It means it's the amount of extra that you spend for every extra dollar of income. So we're going to assume that it's somewhere between zero and one, right? So it's some fraction of that extra dollar. Um, and we might think it's, you know, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.8. And of course, in the real world, uh, it's going to vary by person, right? Some people will save more, some people will spend more. Um, the lower income people tend to have a higher marginal propensity to consume than uh, richer people. In this example here, it is equal to 0 0.6. So when income increases by $10 or $10 billion, then consumer spending increases by $6 or $6 billion. And so our slope for the consumption function is less than one. So we have some positive vertical intercept and we have a slope that's less than one. And that's going to be important for our multiplier model. So adding in investment, for now we're just going to assume that investment is just a fixed amount. And so we add that in, that just shifts up our aggregate demand curve. And so now our vertical intercept is our autonomous consumption C0 plus investment I. Um, in more complicated models, we might also assume that investment depends on output, but for now we'll just have it as a fixed amount. And so our aggregate demand function is just C0 plus C1Y, that altogether is consumption, plus this fixed amount I for investment. So now it has the same slope as it did before with our just our consumption function, which is equal to C1, and that is less than 1. And so what does this give us? Well, it gives us all the amount of aggregate demand for the different values of GDP or total income. And we're going to be able to use that by finding the equilibrium. And so then the question is, well, what is the equilibrium? Well, that's going to be where GDP 
total output is equal to aggregate demand. So where our horizontal variable is equal to our vertical variable. And so in order to find that, we just draw this 45 degree line. And so the 45 degree line is all the points where output Y, that's remember, that's just GDP, is equal to aggregate demand, which in this case is just consumer spending plus investment spending. Now, because our aggregate demand function has a positive vertical intercept and a slope less than one, there is one point where it crosses the 45 degree line where we have an equilibrium. And so that is our goods market equilibrium where aggregate demand is equal to uh, GDP, where we buy the uh, same amount as we produce, right? So there's no change in inventory investment. Uh, so, okay, so that's fine. That's an equilibrium. And so if we needed to find an equilibrium and we had numbers, we could just set them equal and we could find it and it would be this value here or this value here, which are going to be the same. That's not necessarily the most interesting piece of this model. Um, and as I mentioned before, this model is sometimes called the Keynesian cross because it's built on the ideas of John Maynard Keynes and there's a place where two lines cross, which is often true in economics. All right, so let's think about what happens with disequilibrium, right? So with disequilibrium, then say we're at point B and at point B, our output is higher than our aggregate demand. And in that case, that means we're producing more than we're buying. And that means that inventories are increasing. What are firms going to do? Well, firms are going to be like, well, we have better stop producing so much. And so they stop producing as much and we move down until we get to A and we're at equilibrium again. Whereas at point C, here, output is less than aggregate demand. And so if aggregate demand is higher than output, that means that we're buying all the stuff we have in inventory and firms say, oh my goodness, we need to produce more. They produce more and we move up until we get to A. And so A is that point where firms are like, okay, we're producing the right amount. We're producing the amount that people want to buy. So there's no need for us to produce more or produce less. Okay, so... With our model without any government and no trade, we just have GDP is equal to consumer spending plus investment spending plus uh, inventory investment expenditure, right? Changes in inventories. And in our equilibrium, all we're saying is that aggregate demand, which is C plus I, is equal to output. And so our inventory change is zero. And that's really what we mean by equilibrium, right? That we're buying the same amount that we're producing. And so inventories are staying the same. Okay, now let's think about what happens when we get a shock. So in this case, we are starting at point uh, D and we get some sort of negative shock. So in this case, so the way we often uh, write these things in economics is we start with some initial value and then we get a change in the value and we call that, uh, we put an apostrophe there, we call it prime. So in this case, investment spending is decreasing by $15 billion um, from I to I prime. And so this 15 is that initial change in investment spending. So what happens? Well, remember, so now firms are spending $15 billion or euros less in the economy than they were. Well, one person's spending is another person's income. So that means that income has fallen by $15 billion. That means people are going to spend less. And so that gives us a drop initially of uh, 15 from in our aggregate demand function. But then because people's income is lower, that means that they're going to spend $9 billion less uh, in the future. And then that's going to decrease people's income by $9 billion. And so then that's going to decrease uh, spending as well. And it's going to keep moving until we get to Z. And the total change is going to be $37.5 billion uh, in GDP due to that initial change of $15 billion. 
So how did we get this? How did we get these numbers? Well, we're going to go through it in a minute. But the key here is that we're still assuming that our marginal propensity to consume is 0 0.6. And so after that initial 15 billion, then people decrease spending by 9 billion. 9 billion is 15 times that 0 0.6. And then it would be 9 times 0 0.6, uh, which would be what 5.4. And then it would be 5.4 times 0.6, and we would keep going. And we'll eventually get to this 37.5. And so if we wanted to calculate the multiplier, it would be the total change in GDP, which is 37.5, which is also this distance here, divided by the initial change in uh, spending, which was that 15 billion that's over here. And 37.5 divided by 15 equals 2.5. Now, it turns out that all we really need to calculate the multiplier is uh, our marginal propensity to consume, at least in this very simple model. And we can see that um, by doing a little bit of math, uh, really all we're doing is we're setting aggregate demand, which is C0 plus C1Y, that's C, plus I, equal to output. And you'll see we have GDP or Y on both sides of our equation. So what we're going to do is we're going to move this term, the C1Y, over to the left and then factor out a Y. We get Y times 1 minus C1 equals what was left on the right-hand side, so C0 plus I. And then we're going to divide by 1 minus C1 for both sides. And we get Y is equal to 1 over 1 minus C1 times C0 plus I. Now, for some reason, this book likes to call the multiplier k, which is fine. But k is just equal to 1 over 1 minus c1. And that means that in order to calculate the multiplier, all we have to do is know what c1 is. And you'll see, right, if we have c1 equal to 0 0.6, then this is 1 over 1 minus 0 0.6, which is 1 over 0 0.4. And 1 over 0 0.4 is, in fact, uh, 2.5. Now, over here, they're just doing a sort of another way to look at it and showing that this is just really a geometric series where the first change in spending is 1, right? So that was our 15 billion. The second change is times the um, marginal propensity to consume, or C1. The second change is C1 squared, C1 cubed, C1 fourth, etc. This is a geometric series that, again, just simplifies to 1 over 1 minus C1, just what we got using the other method. So good job. That's how we calculate the multiplier. Now, you'll notice that when the multiplier is higher than the, uh, excuse me, when the marginal propensity to consume is higher, so like when it's 0.9, the multiplier is higher. So with 0.9, it would be 1 over 1 minus 0.9, or 1 divided by 0.1, and it would be 10. If it was 0.5, if the marginal propensity to consume was 0.5, then it would be 1 over 1 minus 0 0.5 or 1 over 0 0.5 or 2. So as the MPC, the marginal propensity to consume, gets higher, the multiplier also gets higher, and vice versa. When the MPC gets lower, the multiplier also gets lower. So now we could do a more complete model, right? And... Um, I talk about this like an intermediate macro. This is really just sort of uh, FYI. So we're just going to see what happens. So here in this model, we have a more complete consumption model where we have to take out taxes because people's spending depends on taxes. We have investment that depends on the interest rate R, which we haven't even talked about yet. So don't worry too much about that. We'll talk about that more in the future. Uh, and then also exports and, and imports. And so exports, we just assume are fixed because that depends on foreign countries' uh, income. But imports tend to go up uh, as our income goes up. And so now we have a new term multiplied by Y and, of course, a new term over here with the T. And if we solve for it, then... Uh, what we get is a actually a smaller multiplier. Um, and so that's going to be uh, one of the reasons that the multiplier in the real world is smaller than what we might find in our very simple model, right? 
And so, but it's the same type of thing. We, if we get an increase in autonomous spending, either C0 or, or some level of I, which they called A0, then that shifts our aggregate demand curve up. We move up through the multiplier process to our higher value. And if we get a decrease in autonomous spending, again, we move down to our new uh, output level. But we will be, have, we will be having uh, the same type of thing, but just a smaller effect with, when we include taxes and uh, imports. Now, the other thing that can happen, of course, is that we could get a change in our marginal propensity to consume. So we could get an increase in our marginal propensity to consume so that now our aggregate demand curve is steeper. That will increase our multiplier. Or we could get a decrease in our marginal propensity to consume. Um, and that would give us uh, a smaller multiplier. Um, but notice that just sort of absent any change in spending, the higher MPC leads to a higher equilibrium output and a lower MPC leads to a lower uh, equilibrium output. Um, and this can happen, right? So just remember, the opposite of the MPC, the marginal propensity to consume, is the marginal propensity to save. And so there are times where people are feeling very optimistic, and they save less, and they spend more. That's an increase in the MPC. And then there are times where people get worried, um, and they're more pessimistic about the economy, and they increase their savings, which decreases the MPC. Uh, and that can lead to lower output as well. So this is just a lot of math calculating the multiplier uh, in the full model. And here it is uh, sort of down here. And what we can say really is that because taxes and uh, imports show up as positive numbers in the denominator, that our multiplier in the full model is less than our multiplier in the simpler model. We're going to stick with our simpler model um, just because this is an introductory course. It's just important to remember that taxes and, and imports are ways, we often call them leakages, right? They leak out of the system um, because you send some money to the government in taxes, and so that doesn't get respent. And you send some money overseas by buying imports, and so that money gets spent in that economy, not in uh, our economy. So that was a lot. Um, feel free to go back and, and check it out. We'll have some practice problems um, as well. Um, but uh, understanding that sort of multiplier process is really important because it's going to sort of uh, underlie the way we think about policies when we're thinking about how to smooth out those business cycles that we talked about earlier.